Hey everyone, so I started up memberships. If you're interested in supporting the channel at all, check out the first link in the description or stay until the very end of the video where I'll explain all the perks that comes along with becoming a member. Welcome or welcome back if you're a subscriber to the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg where we will ultimately be covering over 1,000 unique mysteries spanning across over a dozen subgenres such as science, puzzles, true crime, missing persons, and much much more. If you're brand new to the series, we are currently in layer 2 and I'll link the playlist with the previous 8 parts in the description as well as the top right corner so make sure to check those out as well. If you do end up enjoying the video at any point, leaving a like goes a long way in helping me out. Now, without further ado, let's begin. To kick off part 9, our first mystery involves a woman named Shauna Maynard. Shauna's lifeless body was discovered in Las Vegas, Nevada on April 21st, 1998, and at the time it's estimated that she was about 17 years old. It was revealed by authorities that Shauna was kidnapped and shot to death before she was left along the intersection of Blue Diamond Road and Decatur Boulevard. Police were stumped as to who was responsible as there was little if any usable evidence left behind on Shauna. It wasn't until 2015 when an anonymous 4chan user made it known that they had taken the lives of several people. This user's original post went like this. I have killed several women for pleasure. If you can guess a name, I will upload a picture. If you can guess a name of any of these women, I will upload that photo. No more than 10 names per post. Any more than that will be ignored. Some are Polaroids and others were taken with a disposable camera. I also have pictures of them before death when I was able to do so. If you guess all of the names, I will show you where I dumped a body in 1999. The first one is Free as her name is unlikely to be guessed. As you could probably assume, most users on the site didn't take this person seriously and thought they were looking for some sort of sick laugh. But for those that decided to give the mystery individual the benefit of the doubt, they were given the task to guess who this user had killed. And as a reward for correctly guessing who he had killed, he'd also reveal the locations of bodies that had not been discovered yet. Based on some clues given out, another user on the 4chan board guessed the name Shauna Maynard. This turned out to be a correct answer and the anonymous user then posted original photos of Shauna before her death as well as after. And I believe the original thread was deleted, but there are images of parts of the original discussion, as well as an entirely new thread discussing these posts. I won't be showing you guys any of the explicit images as they are extremely graphic, so in case you do want to go out and search for them, please exercise caution. Onlookers now knew that this was not some sort of joke, but instead a very real nightmare. Users that were aware of Shauna immediately contacted Las Vegas authorities to notify them of what was happening online, but unfortunately there was little to nothing that the police could do to find out who was behind the posts. This supposed killer also uploaded an image of what appears to be a man, but that individual was never identified. As is common with many controversial online events, many people actually believe this to be some sort of hoax. It may have been possible that someone got their hands on FBI photographs and decided to play this sick game. In fact, several Las Vegas police officials told news reporters that the online thread on 4chan was not valid, but they were not willing to elaborate on why they came to this conclusion. But it should be mentioned that there are several small details that could be mentioned that suggest that this 4chan user is the real deal. One instance of this can be found within one of Shauna's pictures. This photograph has Shauna with her t-shirt lifted up, exposing her chest. Many people fail to find a reason why authorities would bother lifting up her shirt in this way just to take photos for evidence. And one final detail I'd like to add to this entry before we move on is that Shauna led a pretty secretive life. From what I understand, she actually ran away from home and some people believe her to have been surviving off money that she earned from selling her body. However, this is just a theory fueled by the fact that she was in Las Vegas, which was basically a mecca for that kind of service back in the 80s and 90s. And a decent chunk of the population of these workers were actually minors who ran away from home. It's unclear who Shauna was staying with leading up to her death, and despite having a handful of people come forward and say that they knew Shauna, little to nothing was ever revealed about her personal life.
The Princes in the Tower refers to the apparent murder of the brothers Edward V of England and Richard of Shrewsbury. The two boys were the only sons of Elizabeth Woodville and King Edward IV, who would die in 1483. When Edward and Richard were 12 and 9 years old respectively, they were sent to the Tower of London by their uncle in preparation for Edward V's upcoming coronation. But before the young boy was crowned as the new king, both he and his brother were declared to be illegitimate. This allowed for that previously mentioned uncle, who was the Duke of Gloucester, to take the throne. The last sighting of the two boys was inside that tower and is unclear as to what happened to them while they were inside. And all the talk about the two being murdered is only a theory, and both of their bodies were never actually found. That uncle that I mentioned earlier who is also named Richard was next in line for the crown after the children. So some people theorize that this Richard may have hired an assassin or someone to kill the boys for monetary compensation. This theory goes a little bit deeper as Edward V was known to commonly seek his mother's side of the family in any sort of discussion. And as a result of this, that uncle believed that the Woodvilles would become too influential while Edward was in power. Additionally, Edward spent a lot of time with his other uncle named Anthony who Richard supposedly disliked. Then there's also the fact that if Richard obtained the crown, he could hand the throne down to his own son one day and keep the power within his own family. To most people, this is pretty much an open and shut case. Most believe that the brothers Edward and Richard were in fact murdered, but it's possible that they were just kidnapped and sent to another country or something. There are a few accounts of young men appearing throughout history claiming to either be Richard or Edward, but these are all more or less baseless and largely assumed to just be pretenders looking for attention. If the boys were indeed killed, it's tough to say who actually performed it. Apparently, there was a random casket of bones found in the 1670s that may have been the boys. Several workers were remodeling the Tower of London when they found two small human skeletons stuffed into a wooden box that was buried 10 feet under the staircase. But turns out this wasn't the first time that human remains were found within the tower. There's actually another time earlier in history where a different set of children's skeletons were discovered inside that tower. And when that first pair of remains was found, it was also thought that those could have been Edward and Richard. But as far as I know, I don't think there was any sort of testing at all done for those first sets. But as for that second set of bones that were found, they were examined and tested in the 1930s and it was concluded that they belonged to children who were around the age of 10 to 13, which is pretty accurate with Edward and Richard's age at that time. But unfortunately, the rest of the examination didn't result in any concise information as there were quite a few bones missing from the skeletons. Not to mention, the workers who uncovered the skeletons also damaged them during the process. And finally, many criticized the exam as it was conducted on the presumption that they could have been the princes. This meant that the examiners may have undermined certain methods that didn't immediately identify whether or not these skeletons were Edward and Richard. There was not even any effort made to determine whether they were male or female. Back in the 1990s, there was a television series of Unsolved Mysteries on NBC that was later moved to CBS for its future seasons before being cancelled in 1999. The staff that were in charge of the show received a postcard that was threatening the crew, telling them not to tell a certain story. Part of the postcard said the following, Forget Circleville, Ohio. If you come to Ohio, El Sicos will pay. The postcard was apparently sent from Columbus with no return address and was signed by the Circle writer. So why exactly does this anonymous writer not want this city to be investigated? Circleville is a small town about 25 miles south of Columbus that is said to be pretty reclusive and rarely attracting any sort of outside attention. And turns out that this small town was having similar letters as that postcard circling around between the residents. In fact, these letters were being sent for about two decades before they suddenly stopped. These letters were explicitly unhinged and often contained personal details about the people that they were being sent to. The sender was known by the locals as the Watcher. 
One of the Circleville residents was named Mary Gillespie, and she was oftentimes the recipient of the most dangerous or rather the most threatening letters. Mary was a bus driver and was accused by this watcher of having an affair with the superintendent of the schools. One of her letters read, I know where you live. I've been observing your house and know you have children. This is no joke. Please take it serious. The writer went on to mention that they wanted Mary to end this affair. Mary, not taking the situation too seriously, decided to keep the knowledge of this letter to herself. But just on the off chance this is something real, she kept the letter with her. About a week after Mary had received her letter, her husband Ron received his. This letter informed Ron that his wife was sleeping with the superintendent and that if he didn't do anything to stop it, then his life would be in danger. These letters and this supposed affair quickly became the talk of the town. Ron soon received another letter that read, Gillespie, you have had two weeks and done nothing. Make her admit the truth and inform the school board. If not, I will broadcast it on CBS. Posters, signs, and bills billboards until the truth comes out. Mary and Ron sat down to discuss just what to do about this strange situation and they decided to invite three other people in on this as well. Those three people were Ron's sister, that sister's husband whose name is Paul, and then Paul's sister. Mary informed everyone that she had an idea of who was sending the letters and so she proposed a plan. They would attempt to scare the sender. Paul was quoted to have said that they sent the watcher four or five letters that did not threaten any sort of violence or anything but simply said that they knew who he was and what he was doing. And it seemed like this actually worked. The letters had seemingly stopped for good. But in August of 1977, Ron received a phone call from an anonymous caller and Ron didn't share the details of the call but a journalist named Martin Yant said that this call more or less confirmed Ron's suspicions on who the watcher was. Ron then told his family that he was going to confront the watcher and he proceeded to grab his gun and say goodbye to his kids before sitting out inside the family's pickup truck. But on his way to his desired destination, he lost control of the vehicle and hit a tree. Ron was killed on impact. Before he left, Ron was well aware that the Watcher was keeping an eye on the family vehicle and some believe that the Watcher may have tampered with it as a punishment for not getting Mary to admit to the affair. On the scene of the accident, police found out that the gun that Ron was carrying was shot once between leaving his house and hitting that tree. But there was no clear explanation as to why the gun went off. So police ultimately ruled Ron's death as an accident, but quickly after this announcement, several letters began circulating Circleville accusing the sheriff of a cover-up. Ron's brother-in-law Paul even said that the sheriff changed his story. According to Paul, the sheriff agreed with him that there was foul play involved in Ron's death, but a few days later, the sheriff contacted him and told him that there was no foul play after the police's only suspect passed a polygraph test. In Ron's blood, it was found that he had about one and a half times the legal limits of alcohol, which most people found strange as he wasn't a heavy drinker and rarely even drinked at all. After Ron's death, the letters came back and both Mary and the superintendent ultimately admitted to having a relationship. Mary was able to keep her job as a bus driver, but in 1983, there were these strange signs that were beginning to be posted on her bus route. Mary decided to tear one of them down and when she turned it around, there was this little box and a piece of string attached. Perplexed at what she was seeing, Mary took the box inside of her unoccupied bus and opened it up. Resting inside was a small pistol with its serial number removed. It dawned on her that this was some sort of makeshift trap and when triggered, the hidden gun would have gone off. Of course, Mary assumed this to be the work of that watcher, but we aren't really sure at this point. And this next part is where the case takes a pretty shocking turn. Mary gave the pistol to police for investigation and after several lab tests, they were able to read a majority of the rubbed off serial number and they determined that it belonged to Paul, Ron's brother-in-law. And it turned out that Paul had recently divorced from Ron's sister as well. When Paul was informed of this information, he was appalled that he was now being accused of any involvement in the case. Paul did admit that the gun was indeed his, but he hadn't seen it for a very long time. He further explained that he had set the gun aside and had no rhyme or reason to use it or even check on it. He didn't even know that it was missing until the police contacted him. Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe later requested that Paul take a handwriting test just on the off chance that Paul was the watcher. Paul, adamant that he is innocent, did agree to the test. 
but this test is often heavily scrutinized as it is considered to be a very poorly conducted one. The sheriff simply had Paul take a piece of paper and write as close as he could to match the text from one of the watcher's letters. The sheriff took this piece of paper as well as some past documents that Paul wrote on and compared them, but it seemed although Paul was not responsible for writing the letters. However, while this test was being conducted, the sheriff also went through Paul's garage and gathered quite a bit of evidence. All of this evidence was actually enough to arrest Paul. In October of 1983, Paul went on trial for the attempted murder of Mary Gillespie by using those traps with the gun set inside, but he wasn't charged with anything in regards to the letters. And just one more side note I'd like to provide, on the stand, a handwriting specialist actually stated that in his own opinion, the writing on all of the letters, postcards, and envelopes did match Paul's everyday handwriting. But again, this is just one person's opinion. Additionally, Paul's boss testified that Paul didn't show up for work on the day the gun trap was found. But despite this statement, Paul was actually able to provide a pretty solid alibi for his entire day. Nevertheless, he was still found guilty for attempted murder. After the trial, Paul was quoted saying, I can't blame the jury because the jury didn't hear all the evidence, but I just couldn't believe it. I was really in shock. Everyone assumed that Paul was responsible for the letters and that they'd stop after he had been locked up. But in fact, the opposite happened. The letters began resurfacing over a large area in central Ohio, which just had all of the authorities and the entire population of Circleville confused. The warden of the prison that Paul was staying in even said that it was impossible for Paul to write and send any letters. Paul was described to be a model prisoner for seven years, but when he became eligible for parole, he was denied because the letters were continuing to be sent out and at an increased volume, and everyone assumed Paul was still responsible for them. Even Paul received a letter about a week after he was denied parole. The letter said the following, Now when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago. When we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all. And I'm so sorry for dragging this entry on for so long. There's just a lot of information. But this entry does not end here. Remember that journalist I mentioned earlier named Martin Yant? Well, he was able to gain access to the sheriff's investigative file on Paul, and he was able to uncover evidence that was never mentioned during Paul's trial. According to an interview with Mary by the sheriff, there was another bus driver that had been on the same route as Mary about 20 to 30 minutes before Mary. And when she passed the location where Mary found that sign with the gun, there was a yellow El Camino with a large man with sandy hair standing outside of it. And obviously at first this may not sound suspicious at all, the guy could just be stepping out of his vehicle to get some fresh air. But the man was clearly trying to hide something. Immediately upon meeting the woman's eyes in the bus, this mystery man jerked his head away and shifted his entire body almost in an attempt to avoid identification. This piece of evidence was never followed up on. And that's going to end this entry. Let me know what you guys think. There's just twist after twist in this case. Many people actually believe Ron's wife, Mary, to be responsible. But as far as I know, I don't think she was ever investigated for anything. Kasper Hauser was a young man who lived in Germany during the early half of the 1800s who claimed to have grown up in a complete isolation within a dark cell. Hauser was stabbed to death at the age of 21 in 1833. Hauser's outrageous claims and subsequent death created much controversy and debate on whether or not his claims were actually true. Many theories began to arise that proposed Hauser may have been a member of some royal household that was hidden away, but of course, most wrote him off as a fraud that liked to stretch his experiences into hyperbolic tales. Hauser first appeared to the public in Nuremberg, Germany, and he was estimated to be about 15 or 16 years old at the time. The boy kept saying the same thing over and over again. I want to be a cavalryman as my father was. And due to his intellectual impairment and odd behavior, many residents assumed that Hauser was some sort of wild child that was raised by animals in the forest. As word of this mysterious boy began to spread, more and more people wanted to see and question him for themselves. Hauser shared his past life and said that for as long as he could remember, he spent his life in solitary confinement in a darkened cell. The cell was approximately 2 meters long, 1 meter wide, and 1.5 and meters high. Inside, he only had a straw bed to rest on and two wooden toys, one of which was carved into the design of a horse and the other into a dog. 
Every morning, Hauser was given bread and water, which was set next to his bed while he was asleep. Additionally, this water occasionally tasted bitter and would cause Hauser to fall into an extremely deep sleep. Whenever this happened, Hauser's straw bed was also changed out, and his nails and hair would be trimmed as well. Hauser also mentioned a mystery man that taught him how to write his name. This man was also the one responsible for telling Hauser to say, I want to be a cavalryman as my father was. Hauser later explained that he had no idea what that sentence even meant, he was just told to say it. And something else that I forgot to mention at the start of the video was that when Hauser showed up, he was wearing very tattered clothing and he couldn't even really speak at all. That sentence about the cavalrymen and his father was the only sentence that he could actually say. In the end, the town of Nuremberg adopted Hauser and the residents made frequent donations that assisted in his general living expenses as well as his education. As Hauser casually lived his life, he'd be ushered into the center of attention in several incidents that may suggest that he is a compulsive liar. The first of these events involved Hauser sustaining a deep cut on his forehead that drenched him in blood. Hauser stated that he was attacked by that mystery man that left him in Nuremberg. Additionally, after he attacked Hauser, he said this, You still have to die before you leave the city of Nuremberg. Obviously, there are people that believed Hauser and also people that doubted his story, but those that didn't believe Hauser thought he inflicted this wound upon himself for attention and pity as he recently got into a heated argument with the person who was providing him with housing. About half a year later, he obtained another wound that involved a pistol. Hauser claimed that he fell off of a chair that he was using to reach atop a bookshelf, and when he lost his balance, he ripped off the pistol that was hanging on the wall as decoration. Many people found Hauser's story to be ridiculous and were beginning to question just how many times Hauser may have lied in the past. Gradually, even those that were on Hauser's side slowly began to doubt him. On December 14th, 1833, Hauser returned home with a deep wound on the left side of his chest that was supposedly inflicted by a stranger. Hauser claimed that he was lured into an area where he was given a bag before he was stabbed in the chest. When police went to investigate the crime scene, they indeed found a small bag that contained a note inside. The note read something like, Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself where I come from. I come from blank, the Bavarian border blank, on the river blank. I will even tell you the name MLO. Hauser ultimately died as a result of the chest wound three days later. There were many inconsistencies between Hauser's own accounts and what police found at the crime scene, which led many people to suspect that Hauser stabbed himself and then fabricated this entire tale about being attacked. As for why he did this, more than likely it was because Hauser was looking for more attention as he was in the city for about 5 years at this point and the residents weren't exactly looking at Hauser as this enigmatic figure anymore, but instead just a normal person. Forensic examiners more or less agreed that Hauser's wound could very well be self-inflicted and that perhaps he had originally intended on inflicting a lighter wound. So was Casper Hauser really someone who was imprisoned in a small dark cell since childhood or was he just a pathological liar seeking attention? Well, as recently as 1970, several psychiatrists have stated that it is highly unlikely that Hauser could have developed into what he was rumored to be if he truly grew up in the conditions that he said. These psychiatrists went on to say that Hauser's accounts are so full of absurdities that it's astonishing anyone gave him the time of day. If anything, he possibly had a mental illness and was so deep into his own tales that he himself believed them as the truth. I don't know how long the actual process would take, but if one were to only consume a single type of carb for an extended amount of time, they would eventually reach the point of organ failure as a result of amino acid deficiency. Furthermore, skeptics often point to the fact that Hauser probably would have died from scurvy if his diet was truly just bread due to an extreme lack of vitamin C. But just for the sake of the video, let's give Hauser the benefit of the doubt and say he wasn't lying. Why then was he kept in such terrible conditions, completely isolated from humanity, save for one man? Well, there were several rumors that Hauser may have been the hereditary prince of Baden. This prince was born in September of 1812, but had been swapped out for a dying infant at some point. After over a decade, this swapped out infant could have resurfaced as the boy named Hauser. Hauser 
Miss X is the name given to an unidentified woman whose deceased body was found on March 18th, 1967 in the state of Delaware. It was initially believed that she had died during or after an abortion attempt which at the time was illegal, but medical examiners later determined the true cause of death to have been sepsis. But although sepsis was the reason for Miss X's death, she had clear signs of abuse and foul play was suspected due to the circumstances of how her body was found. When Miss X was found, she was lying on the side of a road wearing only a set of underwear which had its labels removed. Additionally, there was a red ribbon in her hair that kept it from falling into her face. Covering part of her lower body was a laundry bag that had the text Bag O Storage, American Laundry, Dry Cleaning, EX45277. This led some investigators to believe that the possible killer owned a dry cleaning business or Miss X herself was an employee at one. And just as I mentioned earlier, investigators initially thought that Miss X had died as a result of a failed abortion procedure. Reason being was medical examiners found a substance that was often used in this kind of procedure inside her vaginal cavity. But it was later determined that Miss X died of some sort of untreated infection. This peels off into a theory that suggests that Miss X's body was disposed of by the person who was in charge of carrying out the procedure. Since abortions were illegal at this time in Delaware, whoever was helping Miss X probably didn't want to be detected and imprisoned after they found her body. And so, they just decided to dump her. That earlier mentioned bag that covered a portion of Miss X's body was traced to a company known as American Laundry, which was in Trenton, New Jersey. Police contacted the owner of the business and when they were questioned about Miss X, they said they did remember a young woman that matched her description but they had no knowledge of who she was or where she was from. And typically this is where we would end a case like this but fortunately this is one of the entries on the iceberg that is actually halfway solved. And pretty recently in fact. Miss X was identified sometime in January of this year. She was a woman named Patrona Patmios. Patrona was born in Greece and had been adopted into the Patmios family who later immigrated to the United States. Sometime in the latter half of 2022, her DNA was matched to her younger half-brother who was actually looking for her for years. But since this was only her half-brother, the DNA was much tougher to match at first so investigators didn't want to get ahead of themselves and make any premature announcements. However, it is still unknown who left Patrona's body on the side of the road. An ORC or Odd Radio Circle is a large unexplained astronomical object, and as of April of 2021, astronomers have observed five of these. At radio wavelengths, these ORCs become visible and bright around the edges, but at infrared or x-ray wavelengths, these ORCs are not visible. Astronomers have no idea what the purpose of this thing is, and these have only recently been discovered with the first sighting being in 2019. Some astronomers believe that this object is a new class of astronomical object entirely, but it's also possible that this has no significance at all, it's just simply existing for the sake of existing. La Mancha Negra, or in English, the Black Stain, is an unknown black substance that oozes from the roads of Caracas, Venezuela. Despite spending millions of dollars into the research of the mystery ooze, there are still no definitive explanations as to what it is. Since appearing in 1986, the gummy substance has caused numerous car accidents resulting in multiple deaths. La Mancha Negra was first noticed by a group of workers when they were repairing a 30-year-old portion of a highway between Caracas and its airport. After surfacing, the ooze quickly spread and as much as 8 miles of the highway became covered with the unknown material. In the coming days as the weather changed, the black substance expanded and contracted. As conditions got hotter, it grew and when temperatures were cold, it began to shrink. This rubber-like blob created such unsafe conditions that nearly 2,000 people died in traffic accidents on the roadways that it covered over 5 years. As I mentioned earlier, the Venezuelan government invested millions into the research of La Mancha Negra and at first they believed it to consist of oil and dust. So they proceeded to try and push the material off of the roads with pressurized water but it didn't budge. So it was back to square one for them and they came up with another idea to try and dry the substance up. They did this by pouring tons and tons of smashed up limestone over the stains. And it seemed to work but unfortunately it sparked a new problem. Due to how much limestone they actually needed, it left the roads so dusty that the air was unbreathable. 
but in a surprising turn of events around 1996, the slick material just up and vanished for several years. Initially, some thought that the raw sewage from neighboring slums were to blame. As the sewage slowly ran downhill, it found its way under the asphalt, which led to a chemical reaction that broke down the roads. But probably the most commonly accepted theory is that the material formed from all of the old cars spraying their fluids over the roadways. The commissioner of the Ministry of Transport and Communications assumed that La Mancha Negra was an accumulation of dust and oil provided from old vehicles that formed the gummy paste. Moha Moha is a sea creature that resembles a turtle and it's supposedly living in or around the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. The creature itself has a long neck, large dome-shaped back, and a massive fish-like tail. Sightings have it measured at about 30 feet or 9 meters in length and 8 feet or about 2.5 meters wide. The shell itself is about 5 feet in height which is about 1.5 meters. The first reported sighting was in 1890 by a woman known as S. Lavelle who was a teacher in Queensland. In just a few days, 9 additional sightings by different people were reported as well. Some called Lavelle a liar and accused her of being a mythomaniac with tendencies to break out in psychotic behavior. The Moha Moha was feared by many residents as it was rumored that it would attack coastal camps and sometimes drag people into the water by their legs. In January of 2020, a Reddit user by the name of Tontus H asked a question on the r slash tip of my tongue subreddit about the identity of a supposed celebrity on their curtain. Everyone began coming forth with their own answers and theories as to who the person was, but they were only able to agree on one thing, that the celebrity was a woman. Even with the aid of modern technology, the internet was not able to come to an agreement as to who the mystery woman on the curtain was. OP would later state that the curtain was purchased around 2008 in Finland and that everyone else on the curtain is easily recognizable. The rest of the curtain had models and actors including Jessica Alba, Josh Holloway, Adriana Lima, and much more. However, adding to the list of solved mysteries, it seems we also have an answer to this one. Around November of 2021, another Reddit user mentioned that this person may be Brad Pitt. Of course, the statement shocked many people and many were skeptical as they believed the silhouette to be a woman the entire time. So the next task was to obtain the original photograph or image of Brad Pitt that the curtain used. At first, the search for the Brad Pitt image would be unsuccessful, but eventually this Reddit post surfaced with the following photo, which was taken in 1994 for GQ. After you compare the curtain and the GQ photo, the similarities begin stacking up. Some people pointed out that the original photo had Brad with stubble while the curtain has someone clean shaven, but it seems that other men with facial hair had their hair removed as well. Such can be seen with this image of Josh Holloway. If you found this topic interesting, Justin Wang has a video dedicated to it, so definitely go give it a watch if you want to learn more about the specific details in this entry. So in the last part of this iceberg, we went over the Ohio City serial pooper and now we have the pleasure of meeting the Queen West pooper. Within a quiet community in Toronto, Canada, there is a mystery individual defecating on people's property. One of the residents in the area named Judy said this, Sometimes he has a Tim Hortons coffee cup in his hand, so I mean he can use the washroom at Tim Hortons. The article I was linked was posted in 2018 and at that time there were posters plastered on the signs in the neighborhood showing a pretty normal looking guy. On the posters it read, Please be aware this man is defecating publicly in the neighborhood early in the morning. The police have an active investigation to identify him. As far as I know, I don't think this person was ever caught, so he may or may not still be terrorizing the streets of Toronto and painting the city brown with his fecal matter to this day. The Babushka Lady is an unidentified woman that was at the assassination site of JFK in 1963. The woman was given the name Babushka Lady due to the headscarf she had, which resembled the scarves that elderly Russian women wore. In many of the photographs taken of this incident, the Babushka Lady can be seen in the background. After the shooting had taken place and all the onlookers could be seen taking cover, the Babushka Lady was still standing out in the open with a camera. After some more time had passed, she can be observed crossing a street and joining in with a crowd fleeing from the scene. But along with her unknown identity, we also don't know what film or photo she had taken as they have never surfaced. 
In 1970, a woman named Beverly Oliver claimed that she was the babushka lady. Beverly said that she had filmed the assassination with a Super 8 film Yashika, and after she fled the scene, she was confronted by two men. The men identified themselves as FBI agents and requested that Beverly hand over her camera. Beverly, of course, obeyed and she was told that the camera would be returned to her in about 10 days, but she never actually got it back. Now, where this claim kind of falls apart is with the camera. The model camera that Beverly said she used was not available until 1969, six years after the incidents involving JFK. Beverly stated that she received an experimental camera and that she wasn't even sure if the manufacturer's name was on it. Like any entry on this iceberg, theories run rampant with some thinking that the babushka lady was a spy of sorts or even an assassin. Some even went as far as to say that this was actually a man based on their stance. Some of these theories propose that the camera the babushka lady was holding was actually a weapon of sorts, or she used it as a sort of signal. But on the other hand, there are many people that believe that she was just a normal pedestrian. And finally, before we actually move on from this entry, there are a few interesting facts that I found about the actual footage that I'd just like to mention. So in total, there are about six different angles of film taken of this incident, and one of the high quality ones was actually thrown away before someone just took it out of the trash because they thought that, oh, this might hold some sort of value in the future. And this particular piece of film actually helped prove somebody's innocence that was being accused of being a culprit. And then there's the other piece of film of this incident by Abraham Zapruder, who showed up to the JFK event with his 8mm Bell and Howell camera and inadvertently captured the most complete record of the president. Abraham later met with a representative from Life magazine and sold all the rights to the footage for about $150,000. And finally, to end off part 9, we have another halfway solved incident. Pamela Buckley and James Freund are two murder victims who were unidentified for 45 years and during that time they were referred to as the Sumter County Does. It was believed that leading up to their untimely deaths, they were traveling around the United States before being killed in South Carolina. James and Pamela were 29 and 24 years old respectively at the time of their deaths. James was shot three times in his chest and Pamela was shot once in her chest and again through her neck. And it was only in 2021 when the two were identified. However, the culprit still remains unknown. Investigators believe that James and Pamela were killed in a vehicle hijacking incident that likely involved a hitchhiker on August 9th, 1976. When the hitchhiker was about to exit the vehicle, he shot both James and Pamela in the back. Authorities determined the weapon to be a revolver. The bodies were found around 6 a.m. the next morning by a trucker who reported the sighting to a store clerk who then called police. Once the identities of the two were found out, it was realized that Pamela had married very early on in her life but had quickly divorced. Some investigators thought that her ex-husband may have been responsible for the murders, but this was quickly rejected as a possibility. Others believe that the serial killer Henry Lee Lucas may have been the culprit. Lucas himself even told police that he was in South Carolina at the time of James and Pamela's deaths. But police were skeptical when they received this information as Lucas was notorious for giving out false confessions. Lucas ultimately died of a heart attack in 2001 and was never convicted for this particular crime. To this day, the identity of the murderer is still unknown. And that is going to end off part 9. Thank you all so much if you made it here. So like I said at the beginning, I started up channel memberships. This is only for anyone who would like to support the channel further. Never feel pressured in any way to join. You simply liking and coming back to each of my videos is already a very supportive gesture. So for the memberships, all of the tiers provide the exact same thing. You get these badges that evolve over time the longer you are a member for, and you also gain access to all of my videos ahead of time. For now, this early access period will be very inconsistent as I work very spontaneously. Sometimes it will just be a few days ahead and sometimes a whole week ahead. Additionally, since these early access videos will be their own thing, I won't be monetizing them for my members, so that means you can binge the entire 30 to 60 minute video without any 
sort of commercial interruption. I also am going to be providing exclusive polls or community posts where you guys can vote on an upcoming video or you guys can simply suggest topics outright to me. I'm not sure how frequently I can do this at first, but I do want to make this particular perk a monthly thing at some point. And lastly, all the members get a special shout out at the end of every one of my videos. That being said, thank you very much to the very first ever channel members, Hero and Jerome Reuter. Thank you both so much for supporting the channel. So that's going to be it for the video. Again, if you do want to become a member, the uh, link is in the, should be at the top of the description. So yeah, I'll talk to you all again very soon and I hope you all have an amazing day.